Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's Wednesday, and you know what that means. It's time for the Wrestling Inc. AEW Dynamite After Show, and if we got a show for you, we've got Will Ospreay winning, we got Swerve Strickland becoming the number one contender, and we even have Darby Allen hanging out with a guy that looks just like Tony Hawk. Uh, I'm Jack Farmer being joined. I don't know who to introduce first here <laughs> in this case. Uh, George looks busy. So Jimmy Corderas, how are you doing today? Hey, what can I tell you? Up here in Canada, Dynamite joins us and, uh, you know, sipping on a little juice, gin and juice. And, uh, well, I should, can I say that on the air? I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, I have a feeling that today I might be a little bit of a Canadian heat magnet, as I like to call myself sometimes, <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> yeah, you were very spicy on Twitter, so I have a feeling you're going to have some, some hot takes today. Okay, we'll get to it, but I don't want to give it away too early. Let's not... Yeah. Where yeah. do you get a pair of sunglasses like that, Jim? Can you see? I don't, <laughs> that's the problem. You can't see through them very well. That's the only <laughs> issue, you know? <laughs> I like to imagine that they give you Canada vision where everything is like maple syrup and loonies and toonies. And no, the only problem is when you wear Canadian sunglasses with the, uh, with, with the exchange rate, you see less. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hey, if you're losing weight, those things must be great then. Uh, for only for the mirror. Yes. <laughs> well, also with us is George Hermosa reading a book, the woman who would be King, the Medusa story. Now, Medusa is someone you had a chance to chat with, George Hermosa. We. We. We did. Someone we had, we had a chat with. Did you know that Medusa is uh, the same person as Alundra Blaze? That's not true. They were in different My, companies. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. My bad. You know, you know we're actually going to talk about wrestlers being in different companies. I've got a, mm -hmm. uh, a question for you guys a little bit yeah. later. Speaking when it comes of cheap, to... cheap plugs, i got to throw it in there. <laughs> Three, a, a, a pair of great books, by the way. I recommend everyone check them out. Um, uh, both of them really great. And I've got to chat with both of the authors, and both of them were delightful. So, uh, oh, nice. George, I also noticed you're wearing your uh, Dodgers shirt. Of course, uh, they got – when's opening day? Did they already have it? Uh, I, th I want to say technically that uh, one in Korea was like a an official game, but their official like in uh, domestic opening day is tomorrow. Oh, very cool. Well, good luck to them. As a Mariners fan, I have divorced myself from baseball because they have <laughs> let me down too many years now. Um, but uh, let's let's talk about wrestling. Of course, everyone who's with us, thank you so much for joining. Make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. We're going to start with news, as we always do. This is going to be a little bit WWE heavy, as they were the ones kind of breaking news today. Uh, so far, we got some contract news. So it's WWE news now maybe AEW news in the future, but it sounds like Drew McIntyre is still yet to sign a, an extension on his contract, even though he's in a very high profile matchup and pretty much alluding to things happening in the future for WWE on air and on MMA air. I, I should say PW insider elite reported that MMA hour on MMA hour. Becky Lynch said she's in the final two months of her contract. Now, uh, Jimmy, I always like to go for you for go to you for contract stuff because you've been you've had contracts with the WWE. I always ask, is this is it weird that they still haven't signed contracts when they're just a couple months out, or is this kind of typical? Because that is kind of how I know a lot of sports contracts go, where they kind of wait to the last second and then sign. Right. Is this is this pretty typical, or is this a little a little odd that they haven't signed yet? I think the oddness is in the fact that I'm in the mindset of usually this doesn't happen. If they want to keep a talent, someone like a Drew McIntyre, who we've seen lately has been absolute fire. He has found himself. He is doing the best work of his career. Becky Lynch speaks for herself as well. She's a top star. I don't think they're missing the boat on these two. I think hopefully this is my mindset. I'm, I'm, I'm praying at least anyways, that they, understand where they're going and a lot leaks out on the internet as far as contract status and stuff like that maybe they're keeping this a little close to the vest with someone like a drew in a high profile position he is right now going into wrestlemania maybe there is an agreement in place and they just don't want it to get out there yet because as wwe now as a publicly traded company i believe that their contract status with their talent has to be made public, if I'm not mistaken. I could be mistaken mm -hmm. with that. So you don't want it to get out there. Maybe there's a deal in place where, okay, 
We're going to let th things play out, let people speculate on what they want to speculate, but both these talents are pr pretty much kept in-house. That's my opinion, at least. Yeah. Uh, Corey Pride saying it'll get done. I, I would imagine, George, that these are two signings that WWE is going to definitely want to get done. Uh, but, of course, the interesting thing, what makes this interesting, if this was six years ago, we would be like, clearly this is going to happen. But now mm -hmm. the game is a little different. Mercedes Monet uh, reportedly signed for a ton of money. Uh, Okada has apparently signed for a ton of money. If you're someone like Becky Lynch and Drew McIntyre and you're looking across the street at the other guys, you got to be saying to yourself, wow, maybe I could make a lot more money. They maybe have changed the game. It reminds me you're a Dodgers fan. You're a sports fan. Reminds me a bit of when free agency starts and that mm -hmm. first domino falls mm -hmm. and someone signs the massive contract and everyone else says, well, I want a massive contract. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that that might play into this? I think so, uh, especially with a lot of uh, the chatter that was happening about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago with Mercedes and her uh, rumored contract that she got by AEW making her the highest paid woman in the history of professional wrestling. Uh, yeah, there's got to be some kind of talk as far as uh, or thought process behind somebody like a Becky Lynch uh, saying like, wait, I, I, I think I deserve that money as well, especially her book coming out yesterday, uh, by the way. WWE, we, uh, we, me and Jack would be more than happy to interview Becky Lynch promoting her book, uh, and you know, kind of making the mainstream going, doing, doing that kind of things. By the way, uh, I don't think it'll happen, but Becky Lynch going to AEW would be ginormous. I mean, I think that'd be even bigger than than Mercedes Monet. Uh, but also at the same time, a little, I'm a little frustrated because, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm somewhat of a I like to get the, the the juice, the gossip, right? Whatever the news happenings. I feel like this Drew McIntyre contract situation, it feels like it's a story every other week. Oh, mm -hmm. he signed, he didn't sign, he signed, he didn't sign. I, to be honest with you, I'm a little over it. Uh, you know, it's... In about two weeks, we're going to talk about maybe obviously two weeks is going to be post WrestleMania. He might even be world champion. Uh, if he does become world champion at WrestleMania Sunday, people are going to be talking about, oh, of course he signed. He probably signed a, a while ago. So uh, I, I'm a little over that talk as far as um, Drew McIntyre. Uh, was there somebody named Laura Rock? Yes, in the chat. Laura you, know, you know what, Laura? You rock. I just wanted to say that. Um, <laughs> but but I think I think the Becky Lynch story is, is way bigger than the Drew McIntyre story that we've been hearing for the last six months, apparently. Yeah. You know, Jimmy, and I know, and in the chat, you know, I see people like Corey pride saying it'll get done. And I think the idea of these two leaving WWE seems unrealistic, but we have seen in the past that it's absolutely not impossible that someone may play for the other team. And even if you love a company like, like Becky Lynch clearly loves WWE. Drew McIntyre clearly loves WWE. It, it is, it's hard to look at someone else and see that they're making more money than you and just go, yeah, but I like where I work. It's nope. a very tough, it, that, that's tough, right? It is, it is a tough call, but it also depends on what you want to accomplish in your career mm -hmm. as well. And, and especially now in WWE under the Paul Triple H Levesque regime, it's a dip different atmosphere completely there. The talent feels a little bit more uh, relaxed mm -hmm. under, because under the previous regime, you know, there was that little anxiety, oh, we got to please the boss. Oh, boy, what happens if we don't please the boss? That kind of attitude. Now with Triple H in charge, uh, he's more accessible. He's more laid back. He's easier with the talent. And again, getting back to what you want to accomplish in your career, yes, mm -hmm. there is someone on the other side who could offer you a lot of money, but what does that mean when they bring you into the company and where do you fit into their plans and where do you go from there? And we'll get into stuff like that when we talk about the show tonight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in WWE, there's other opportunities to expand. Like you get the, your merchandise check every month, whatever that happens to be. And you're in the 2K24 game and that means something too, money-wise. So there's other avenues in WWE to make money. I don't know what the deal is in AEW, I can only speak for WWE that there's other places in the company where they can make money. And that also is a factor. Right. And to be fair, too, I think because uh, I know we talked about how much Drew and, and Becky love WWE. I'm going to be Mr. Optimistic here. I'm going to say somebody like a Mercedes loves the WWE as well. But when you have that kind of mentality of like, man, like I want to go to Japan, uh, maybe she'll go to Mexico at some point. Like there's so much. There's so much, and again, this is not diminishing WWE at all. I think their women's division is amazing, uh, especially when you have like somebody like Becky go to NXT and kind of work that system as well. But 
there's something also in like going to a stardom, going to an AEW and kind of being able to have that, you know, kind of control your own destiny, that kind of aspect in someone's career. And again, we don't know what Becky's uh, situation is. I know hers is a little bit different. Obviously, like by all means, from what I hear, uh, her and obviously Seth travel on a tour bus with their child together. So, mm-hmm. uh you know, by all means, they're always together. You know, maybe maybe that is going to outweigh her wanting to go to a Japan, which she's. I think she's already been. Like she's already kind of traveled the world. But obviously, being an indie wrestler in 2013 is a lot different than being one in 2024. But again, I I, I think it's going to be a win-win no matter what for a Becky Lynch, whether she wants to stay in the WWE, WWE, whether she wants to do other things. Um, yeah, I, I'm all for. I'm really excited to see what's gonna what's next for her. Yeah, and really quick, if I can just uh, piggyback off of what George said, back in the day, you sacrificed a lot of family time with mm-hmm. that schedule, being on the road 250, 300 days a year. You know, like I said, there's you, you're away from your family. You miss birthdays. You miss special occasions. You miss uh, anniversaries, whatever the case may be. This is an opportunity for Becky and Seth and the, their, their child to be together, which in the past didn't happen. Now it's a it's a possibility for so that could play a major factor in her mm-hmm. wanting to resign or not. Yeah, and, and I think that um, of course I see you know Corey Pride again going on about where the bigger option is. First off, I just want to say um, I, I'm not trying to pitch one side or the other. I will admit it's always more spicy and fun when it's someone going mm-hmm. to the other side, whatever mm-hmm. direction they go. You know exactly. what I mean? Um, it was more spicy when Brian Pillman went to NXT than it was if he had stayed just because that's the same, same mm-hmm. thing with, you know, Adam Cole going to AEW. It's more spicy. It's fun. It's different. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. That said, uh, you know, to the point of yes, WWE is bigger, but again, to everyone's points here, sometimes it's about the money and sometimes it's about the creative freedom. And sometimes it's about a lot of other things that go into it. And again, you know, if there was a, a smaller company that offered more money, people sometimes go for that. You see a lot of actors do that where maybe they take smaller roles. I think Gerard Butler does this where he maybe isn't in the biggest movies anymore, but he self produces all his movies. So he's probably right. making a bunch of money. And there's a lot of musicians that maybe they're not the biggest names, but because they self produce, they make a lot more money. That's a different you know industry. But I'm just trying to say that sometimes it's about more than just, who is going to be on the biggest screens or the, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. I should say. It's always Uh, interesting to see, you know, and then going back to the sports analogy, one of our, kind of person that we kind of affiliate a lot especially like a michael jordan right we automatically think the bulls but man it was pretty interesting seeing him in a wizard's jersey you know it's always that right. kind of weird like oh like uh, it's it's interesting it's neat but yeah it, it, it's to me it's more interesting seeing that that you know kind of seeing somebody out of their element what are they going to do with a different playbook exactly like tom brady's a perfect example as well you've seen him so many years in new england and then all of a sudden he's in tampa bay and you go whoa yeah. can he yeah. still do it yeah. yeah, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not, but it's more interesting to mm-hmm. see that. It's spicy, spicy uh, as you say. Spicy, yeah. I Now, I want to, uh, Jimmy, one last thing about this before we go. Uh, Corey Pride had also mentioned uh, they have to do Punk versus Drew. That'll mm. be SummerSlam. My question to you is, Jimmy, is it does feel like they need to do Punk versus Drew, but that means it's a two-way street. WWE is going to want that want that match, and Drew is going to want that match. Who has the bigger negotiating power in a situation like this? Someone like Drew, like, look, man, everyone wants to see me in that match. But WWE also being like, look, man, if you want to be in that big match, there's only one place it'll happen. Do you have any insight to how that uh, negotiation process may look or who may have the leverage in a situation like that? I think the person who has the leverage here is Drew. He definitely does, because as we've talked about so many times right now, he is spitting fire on the microphone. He's doing it in the ring. He ticks all those boxes and he has teed this up perfectly to set up him and punk down the road. Mm -hmm. Now, and the protagonist is in place. There's not a problem there. And now you need that antagonist. And that's what Drew McIntyre is doing brilliantly right now. Mm -hmm. And he is setting it up. We saw it on Monday night. Those guys in the, Even Seth, you know, whatever happens at at WrestleMania with Seth, Drew is someone you can go forward with. And I think he's got the negotiating power in on his in his pocket right now or whatever analogy you want to use. Right. 
I uh, I love it when the wrestlers have the the negotiation power. I like when they, I always say the companies are going to make their money. I want the people to make their money too. Mm-hmm. Um, some other news about maybe people making money is PW Insider is reporting that uh, WWE is reaching out to Hall of Famer Stone Cold Steve Austin and Hulk Hogan in regards to some kind of surprise appearance at WrestleMania. George, I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit. I mentioned this news story to you before you went on air, and you said that's not news. Uh, <laughs> tell me, uh, tell me your thoughts on whether or not these two stars could potentially be at WrestleMania. That that was confidential information, Jack Farmer. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it, it's not news. Like I, I would th- like if saying, "Oh, John, or they're trying to bring in Cena, Austin, or Hogan to like a uh, Money in the Bank." That's news, right? But I will think that they're going to try to sit there and bring in anybody and every good buddy for WrestleMania weekend. Like, I don't know. I just, yeah. I just kind of think it's a given. I, I feel like, uh, God bless the people at wrestling Inc. But I just feel like it's just like a, like a, it's just kind of, you know, let, let's write an article. Let's write about, you know, them bringing in Hogan Austin as if like, like did, didn't, don't they kind of do that every year anyways? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. Jimmy, we've kind of fantasy booked, uh, the end of night two and legends mm-hmm. potentially helping out Cody Rhodes. Uh, these guys would absolutely fill that role. Um, uh, mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on these guys? Mm-hmm. Well, the Easter egg, as we talked about on Monday night, was planted mm-hmm. at that final segment when Rock beat the living tar out of mm-hmm. Cody, where he yeah, he actually made him bleed. And I went back and watched it again. And I want because I'm not good at lip reading, but I wanted to hear kind of see what I thought Rock whispered to Cody in that segment. And I think he said, "Tonight you're going to bleed," is what I think he said. And then at the mm-hmm. end of the night, you know, full circle, there we get it. But when they fought outside, like I said on Monday night. One shot was that tractor trailer that was parked at the loading dock. And whose two faces were on the side of that? Stone Cold and John Cena. Two legends. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't mind seeing them involved in some form on the Sunday night, but I don't want them involved with Roman or Cody. Mm-hmm. I want them to even the odds against the bloodline at ringside before the match and take them out of the equation so that Roman and Cody can go at it alone. Because if Ro- Cody is going to finish his story, on night two of WrestleMania, it has to be him and him alone who defeat Roman and not with the help of. Yeah. You know, insert so and so superstar's name here. It reminded uh, me of that one segment, maybe like six, maybe nine months ago. It was like a backstage segment in, in uh, on SmackDown, and it was a it was a week that Roman wasn't there. But like in the background, you see, you know, it was Roman's picture on the truck. So it was kind of like they were talking about Roman. And it was just kind of very symbolic, as if like a, even when you think he's not around, like he's still watching you. And mm-hmm. I, I love that when that happened i loved it i mean i'm talking about i loved it so much and i'm, I'm gonna be the first to admit i didn't notice it when i was watching it on raw i was too focused on you know cody rock and the blood but yeah little things like that like they, they don't like i like to sit there and actually like like give people credit like i don't think they did it on accident i really think that was a purposely done and bravo to to all the people involved with that mm-hmm. yeah absolutely well a lot of things are purposely done tonight and we're going to talk about aew dynamite and so that's what we are here for but as always i want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us and ask you all to take a moment and give us a five-star review a like a comment a share subscribe uh five-star review would be great uh on apple podcasts and even if you are you know, already watching and you're here in the chat, a little comment just to say that you like the show is very helpful on YouTube. Uh, if you're here in the chat with us now, always good to see you, whether you're stalking you with the uh, little dog emoji, always good to see you stalking you. Uh, we also got I am error, error talking about the Shibata Osprey match and Corey Pride, who I've mentioned a few times already, but still want to give you a shout out, even though we are disagreeing on AEW. Uh, <laughs> Killer of Demons, Laura Rock, uh, Maria Baxter. I haven't seen you before, Baxter. Good to see you. Appreciate you coming through. Uh, mm-hmm. Fernando saying AEW is fire tonight. Tommy O oh, in the chat, as well as Brianne Milligan and Carman Live 2 and Jamie Williams. Who, by the way, Jamie Williams is a big fan of you, Jimmy Cordero. Oh, well, thank you very much, Jamie. I appreciate that. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not give a shout out to all of the lurkers like <laughs> Carrie Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us, Carrie. And all the lurkers, you guys are appreciated. Let's chat about AEW Dynamite. Light the fuse, feel the boom. I guess we don't say that anymore. But uh, we start with Will Ospreay versus Shibata. The match is set up because Ospreay wants to show Danielson 
He can beat the people <sighs> Danielson has beat. We get a little video showing the history of Osprey and Shibata, and then the match. It's a really, really good one uh, with Osprey getting the win and some respect shown afterwards. George, uh, with AEW, I always say the strength of AEW, especially in the ring, is their ability to have major clashes of styles and two guys who have totally different styles of wrestling but still put something together that's pretty cool. And I thought that this match was really a good example of that. Yeah, I think I thought I thought they meshed really well, and obviously kudos to both these guys. Uh, Shibata's got a very, very, uh, I guess you can say, strong style of professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. uh, Osprey's kind of showing more and more every week that he's kind of a like a hybrid of like a lot of styles that he's able to to adjust. Kind of reminds me of like a Shawn Michaels where he, or Randy Savage where he could they can wrestle with big guys, small guys, faces, heels, and they can wrestle as all those people as well. Um, and Osprey's more and more. It's kind of reminded me of that. Obviously Obviously, he's pacing himself a lot more uh, now that he's on, you know, on TV matches, obviously, is a little bit different than being on indie show or PWG style matches. But yeah, like I said, I, I knew this wasn't going to disappoint. So for me to say, like, it wasn't, it was great. Or for me to say it was great, like, obviously, it was great. Like, there was nothing, uh, no denying that at all. So yeah, I, I, like you said, a very good clash of styles, but also they meshed re really well though. so uh, and we can tell that the difference between what we saw was it uh eight nine ten years ago from when they first wrestled up until now osprey being a bigger guy now back then he was a junior heavyweight um yeah like i said he he's he's able to maneuver his body a lot more uh, uh meticulously now i guess you can say uh fernando says this was one of the best opening matches to dynamite at uh, to one of the best opening matches to dynamite ever Corey Pride says, great match. I need more story. I wasn't there emotionally. And Joe C says, let's learn. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but Jimmy, uh, I, I'd love your thoughts on this one. I know you've got a, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're going to use it today or a ref and rant, but I, I know, I know there's a part of this match that you're probably going to want to talk about, but I want to, I want you to get to your thoughts on the match, but also, um, the fact that they did talk about the history a little bit of exactly. Osprey and Shibata and the fact that there is a little bit of the story of, hey, Shibata beat him last time and he wants to show Brian Danielson, look, you just beat him. I can beat him now. I am at your level. No, that's what I liked. And that's what I like, uh, something that they're doing differently than they did before, because in the past, AEW would put a match together, throw it out there, assuming that their the entire audience knows the backstory because they're catering to that niche audience at the time and and they read the internet and they watch the new Japan stuff and they watch everything. This time they teed it up well for those who may not know the backstory between these two. And the match itself for the most part was great. There was one little thing though I wish they would have done differently is when they went to the outside, uh, we could talk about how long they were out there for but I don't want to go there because I, I enjoyed okay. the match very much. When yeah. you know when Osprey was selling his shoulder on the outside, I wish that Shibata would have focused on the shoulder more in the match. Mm. There were times when he did, but he went away from that to do other stuff. I wish he would have focused on that and let that story and, and Osprey fighting from underneath as a baby face does. Who's, he sold really well in the match. Don't get me mm -hmm. wrong, but you know, sell that body part. He can't perform this maneuver because of this. And just a little bit of that, just to add to the story. And they did tone it down. George was right. They did tone it down. He didn't have to do, you know, I have to get one of these in every week. Didn't have to do a twisting, burning 450 hammer Phoenix splash to get the pop just so people could go, yay, and that's it. They told a good story in the match. They toned it down. They did the big spots when they needed to be told. Mm -hmm. Their timing was very good. And you can see that genuine uh, like that the crowd has for Osprey. It's there. He has a connection with them, and it's really uh, it's working. Yeah, I agree with you completely. And, and like I said, I'll let the outside – Part portion be safe for one of your ref and rants. You don't can have I, to go into it now. No, it's can just, I, but, yeah. no, go but, ahead. <laughs> oh, like, can i just can yeah. i just add one thing though um because obviously people will knock aew whatnot on like oh they just signed somebody and they're not being featured or they're not like i'm gonna give i'm gonna give all the praise to aew because ever since he got signed or ever since revolution he's been there every week whether it's in the ring or on the mic like i think they're doing everything right with will osprey like i have to say that i know there's a lot of people who are so quick to, to to focus on something negative and i'm not saying it's right or wrong i'm just saying people are so quick to focus on the negative i'm here to say you know what i know Notice the complete opposite. I notice every single week he's either in the ring on the mic and he knocks it out of the park every single time. Yeah. Yeah. 
I know. I, I absolutely agree. And uh, I want to actually take this, uh, George, to I want to follow that up. Uh, Julianne Harris Keys had a comment, though. It says it takes Will 20 minutes to be every opponent. That's getting repetitive. Uh, I want to wow. I want you to give your thoughts on that, George. But also, I guess I want to rebu rebuke that in the sense that everyone that Osprey's faced so far has been a pretty heavy mm -hmm. challenger as opposed yeah. to someone he should cakewalk so do you think but do you think it's fair that it takes him so long to beat these beat these opponents so what are your I, thoughts on this? i think in this case it is i mean you look at the first guy that he beat Takeshita. i mean that's not going to be a five minute match uh but even like a kyle fletcher who by all means obviously is not uh with all due respect like not like a world champion caliber uh osprey's mm -hmm. got the lineage of you know being a new japan champion uh you know, even today, like Shibata's got a lot of history in New Japan and done a lot of good things in back then. But by all means, like Kyle Fletcher, he's kind of a tag team wrestler. But at the same time, he probably knows Will Ospreay a lot better than a lot of these other guys. That's why we saw in that match, we saw Kyle Fletcher being able to counter a lot of his Will Ospreay's moves. So I think it makes sense for the most part. Now, if we saw somebody like, uh, I don't know, what, what a private party, again, with all due respect, go 20 yeah. minutes like that, that's kind of a little too much. You know, obviously, like, he shouldn't be so well-versed in the book of Will Ospreay just yet. But you know, we haven't seen that. Like you said, he's, he's faced just top guys and... and by all means, they should they shouldn't be quick wins either. Yeah, she, Julianne follows that up with uh so where's Kyle since the match? He's the uh he's a ring of honor champion and he's in the uh Don Callis family. Um so he's he's still doing so he yeah, I, I get the point. He's not the, a huge star, but he's also a partner of Will Ospreay, which makes it a and, little bit and really quickly, uh Julian, I understand or was it just was it Julian Ju who made the comment? Oh, Julian. I'm sorry. I, I think I said Julian. I apologize. I read that wrong. No, it's um, I get where she's coming from, but at the same time, and for it, that was his debut match, was it not for Dynamite? Yeah, uh, for Dynamite. Yes, since the signing. Yeah. So you want to display him and let him show his wares and show what people are are tuned into, and they had a hell of a match. And mm -hmm. what that match did for me, at least, anyways. Yes, we where have we seen Kyle Fletcher since then? We haven't seen much of him. But at the same time, people are now aware of the name mm -hmm. because of his association now in that match with Will Ospreay. So it did help him to a certain degree. It's just where do they go next with him? But Will Ospreay is the end game here, and that's what you want to do. And you want that first match to be uh, very impactful. Right. And with all due respect to Kyle Fletcher, that match wasn't about Kyle Fletcher. Right. Uh, so, you know, not everyone who is on TV needs to have a – year-long game plan laid out for them sometimes mm -hmm. the role is just to do that role um but Jimmy, i want to follow up uh with uh, something that happened right after this is mm -hmm. we got a video package for brian danielson and there's two things i liked one i want to give flowers to aew because we've talked about sort of the format in the past i thought this was really well timed because that's who will osprey is facing and so you have will osprey get a win Brian Danielson promo package to show mm -hmm. us who it is nice and bundled together. I want your thoughts just on the, I guess the production it feels like AW is starting to figure a lot of stuff out recently, right. but also I want your thoughts on this. They didn't mention anything about WWE in the Brian Danielson video package. Now we've talked about how AW mentions WWE too much sometimes. So part of me mm -hmm. feels like, well, that good. They left it out. But part yes. of me also feels like, he did a lot of big stuff in WWE. You're just going to brush <laughs> over that. Like, do you, think it was the right, do you think it was the right call to not mention WWE in the video package? In a sense, I do. I, I don't want to fence it here. It would have been good to mention his accomplishments there, but at the same time, you don't want to make, put the focus on them, especially right now during WrestleMania season, where the, a lot of the focus is on WWE right now. Stay the course. I like the way they did the video package, and I like their production the way they, and when they, the way they presented it. I don't mm -hmm. want them to be WWE. I don't want them to be copycats of what they do, but I like to, to do take some elements of how they produce their television and incorporate that and make it feel like their own. Yeah, And that's what they're doing with these video packages now, and I like that. And w again, one little thing I would have liked to have done is you, you want to tie the two together, the Will Ospreay big win against uh, Takeshita. You want to – or um, sorry, Shibata. Shibata. Yeah, my, my bad. Yeah. Um, but – have him celebrating in the ring and then have that video package play on the screen and have a shot from behind Osprey of him mm. staring at the video screen. 
you know, and have them kind of in, and get his reaction after it. And, go, you know, that kind of, he had that fun look after the match, like, yes, I won. I'm so excited. But now it's like, Oh, maybe I got myself into something here. Yeah. I actually really like that. That would have been, I think that would have been a really cool again. Cause you want to tie it together. These two mm -hmm. are facing each other. You kind of, as we always say, kind of beat it into people's heads. This right. is what's happening. Uh, George, any thoughts on the uh, Brian Danielson promo or video package? What I loved about it is how they reiterated, like, this is his last year, and he's not going to go down without a fight. So it, I felt like it added some stakes. Like, Osprey needs to still prove himself in AW, but Brian Danielson isn't going out just putting people over either. I think it's a good way to remind us uh, that, you know, obviously the match is happening. We didn't see Daniel Bryan in person. We already kind of saw that promo happen like two, three weeks ago. Uh, so we, we don't need to kind of see it again and again and again. So it just kind of added on a whole new element of like, hey, don't forget Bryan's accomplishments. Don't forget everything that he did outside of AEW, uh, obviously more so focusing on Ring of Honor. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I dug it. I, I, I dig video packages in general. I think they're kind of a lost art when it comes to maybe not a lost art because it happens all the time. But it's one of those things where it's like, if you know how to do it right, it's going to add on so much more to a presentation of a promotion, of a wrestler, of a feud, of a, a becoming match, like of all those things. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree completely. And uh, we move on and Young Bucks versus Private Party goes down. It's part of the tag team tournament before the match. Uh, one of the things I really liked, the Young Bucks had an interview segment with Renee where they recap basically what they've done. They've quote-unquote retired Sting. They've restructured the Elite. They added mm -hmm. Okada. Now their goal is to win the tag team titles. They have the match. It's a fun match. Um, but again, Jimmy, what I liked about this, and this is some, I feel like, again, it feels like AEW has really like taken a lot, learned a lot of lessons recently. The Young Bucks reiterating what the story is. They're not just saying we're the Young Bucks and we're having a match. They're kind of going through the list. We are the bosses. We've taken this guy out. We're doing this. This is what's going on with our story. Now we're going to have a match. Not to sound repetitive too, but I've loved the way that they've changed their style and their approach in the ring. They mm -hmm. are acting like heels, like like really nasty bosses, as, as they call themselves, the mm -hmm. EVPs, so to speak. Uh, what I would have liked to have seen, again, differently in this match, on the finish, and I know a lot of people are going to say, well, they kind of uh, foobarred that, uh, the, the, the finish there a little yeah, bit, the, but the that's trigger, okay. Yeah. Some, sometimes that happens, but still, mm -hmm. when they did the double cover, the referee shouldn't have counted right away and have one of the young bucks go, Count or you're fired. Mm. And then he counts one, two, three. Because now the the referee's afraid of for his job. Yeah. Kind of that adds a little more like, what a SOB these guys are. You know what I mean? Threatening people's jobs and stuff like that. Little twists, just little yeah. things you can add to make them more disliked. You know, it's it wouldn't be the first time there was a a evil referee, right? But mm -hmm. it'd be kind of cool if they had a referee in their back pocket and maybe that referee started wearing like uh Rolexes to the ring or like <laughs> just start having uh, little things where you could see that they were clearly taking payoffs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where, where, where thousand yeah. dollar sneakers in the ring or whatever. The yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'd be like, Whoa, that's, that's really nice shoes that the referee's that's, wearing today. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, or just different things like, or maybe the referee has like diamond earrings in or whatever. I don't know. Just something. So you're like, mm -hmm. wow, that those must've cost a fortune. How do you get those? And then when the young bucks go for the pin, they count really fast. And you're just like, right. Oh, Wait a minute. Oh, I get it. Now. Yeah. Okay. Hasn't uh, been done in a long time. What's old is new again. Yeah. Yeah, I think that could be a fun, and I think Young Bucks and AEW is very good about having like a little bit of like a lot of fun with that and kind of being a little silly with it. And because it's a silly idea with those guys, you could I think you could make it really funny and, and fun right. too. Um, again, something they did great during this is they reiterated the story of Private Party beating the Young mm -hmm. Bucks in 2021 mm -hmm. to help add some threat there. And George, the thing that really shocked me about this one, and with all due respect to Private Party, is the crowd was really behind them in this. Yeah. I mean, I thought, frankly, the private party hasn't really been on TV very much recently. And I know there was an injury that kept them off. So really it's been like a year or so since they've been hot on TV, but the crowd, I don't know if it, I, that's private party or if that's the young bucks, but they were really behind private party here. I mean, with all due respect to private party, I think it's more so the books doing their job really, really great. 
Um, mm -hmm. Again, private party, because especially with private party, it's like, are they faces? Are they heels? They kind of sometimes act like heels, but sometimes they act like faces. So they're in that kind of limbo stage of like, we don't know whether they'll fully be behind them or to fully be like, you know, when they, especially when they're like, uh arguing with like top flight and like you know they were with the hardys not too long ago so they're great i'm not saying that they're not but i think it is more of a testament to how great the bucks are in their role mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh so george to follow up on that one is this the is this tournament the young bucks tournament to win i mean i feel I'm, like i feel like they're the they're gonna win it yeah i mean i think they should uh especially mike i would have picked the kingdom all the way uh, I kind of mentioned last week on how it, the undisputed kingdom hasn't really been going that great as far as you know everything that's happened since since December. Uh, mm -hmm. They're kind of on the right track, but they're just kind of up and down, up and down. Now that they're eliminated, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, yeah, I, I totally think it's going to probably set up maybe Bucks versus FTR, uh, and I totally see the Bucks with their new uh, their new direction, and I, I love to see what they would do with this new direction and with the championship gold around their waist. Yeah. Well, George alluded to it, Jimmy. Later in the night, best friends versus undisputed kingdom. Uh, a lot of fun moments, but it really broke down when uh, Roderick Strong tried to help undisputed kingdom get the win, but best friends outsmarted them and they get the win. We get a quick stare down between the teams uh, before they move on. They're going to face each other, best friends and young bucks, I mean, uh, in the semifinals. Anything to take away from this one? Uh, you know what? It was fine it was a typical aew tag team match so um nothing really stood out to me other than the obvious uh, i i, I kind of expected the uh, um orange cassidy and, and uh, wow. trent trent uh, to to uh to win this one so to set up them in the bucks so yeah, yeah. It, it was it was fine for what it was but nothing really wowed me unfortunately orange cassidy uh, is always a delight to watch uh even sometimes he does the simplest things and it's entertaining. Uh, obviously we're not going to remember the quality of this match in, a, in about a couple weeks, but yeah, like, like Jimmy said, it, it was fun. It, it felt like the right team won in this one, uh, George, yes. it sounded like you thought undisputed kingdom should have won. Uh, to me, I, I, th I feel like best friends are a team that's kind of, especially with orange Cassidy, they're, I guess a, a bigger name team. Cause orange Cassidy has been such a star, uh, mm -hmm. for AEW. Uh, but you said you were, you had some thoughts about undisputed kingdom. Did you want to talk about them a little bit more? I just thought with the momentum and them really trying to capture what, what's been missing from whatever their spiel, from whatever their stick is of these past couple of weeks of like momentum and, you know, Wardlow and Adam Cole, like keep them relevant. Have them be double champion, have them be a a a AEW and Ring of Honor tag team champions. What better visual to have than having Undisputed Kingdom with all this gold? They already got the international gold. Why not have, you know, add on the AEW tag team championships to their to their group and again nothing you know it's like it's yeah. like they're kind of having nothing to show for it i mean the ring of honor tag team title or tag team championships it's okay i mean i'm still a little confused on like how that works out as far as like we see these guys we see you know kyle fletcher show up but we see no athena so mm -hmm. I, again mm -hmm. I, I i don't know how that works but again i yeah i, I i'm i'm I, this is me wanting to see more of undisputed kingdom i want to see adam cole on the mic i want to see roger strong you know he hasn't really done anything since he won the championship either so i i don't know i think i'm hoping that we'll see some kind of twist some kind of curve mm -hmm. with kind of how the aew has been booking their storylines recently as far as there's mm -hmm. more structure so i like to see that one get a little more structure now now yeah, not, not that, that I, and true. and not that I have to warn. Sorry to cut you off there, Jack. Not okay. to have to. Not that I have to warn Roderick Strong about anything like this, but be careful taking bumps wearing glasses. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah. you, you never yeah. know. You never know. Um, yeah, I do. Uh, you know, we we talk about that V trigger uh, or whatever. That, what, do they, what do they call it now? EVP trigger. I can't remember, mm -hmm. but uh, yes, you know. Um, there is the uh, the slip there. I feel like that is kind of an analogy for the Undisputed Kingdom in that it felt like they had something ready to go. Mm. There was an injury. It kind of slipped the beginning, and they just haven't been able to get the force back behind it since that moment. And uh, I agree. They need to do something to feel like a threat because right now they Man. just don't feel like a threat. And the right. Ring of Honor tag team titles, are they're cool for Ring of Honor, but on Dynamite, they don't have the same weight. It's, it's, uh, it's very... It's 
it, it reminds me a bit of Alice in Wonderland. You're not in Wonderland when uh, you, when you have, or uh, I used to get Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. You're not in Oz when you're not in Ring of Honor. They don't have power there. <laughs> yeah, Dorothy, uh, you're no longer in Oz, right? Yeah. It, yeah and that just, story it, was so you, hot. Yeah, and for some reason, uh, using utilizing the ROH titles in any capacity, it kind of loses its cachet because now you're confusing a little bit of your audience. Wait a minute, why is the ROH brand on this? You know, if they had their own separate show, whether it's syndicated television, wherever you want to put it, that would be fine. But kind of matching when you bring them in occasionally, it kind of confuses the audience, I think, a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when there's no current AEW tag team champions. And then you see right. a tag team. They, I mean, I think it's been a story for a while. So they need to consolidate some titles or or things like that uh, in AEW. Uh, final question, George. Did uh, the Young Bucks need to get Cody Rhodes' permission to use his elevator? <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that, too. I noticed like that that was pretty clever on that, that how they're utilizing that now. Obviously, Cody be kind of kind of became a little bit of a heat magnet toward the end of his AEW run. Uh, mm -hmm. So I kind of like that the Bucks, um, you know, they give shout-outs to each other here and there, so I wouldn't be surprised if not so much of a permission, more of a Hey, uh, just a heads homage? up, you know. Homage? Yeah, just just a head. Yeah. <laughs> hey, just just a text here, you know. But hey, guess you should tune into Dynamite to see what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, because I don't think there was a text thrown when Cody smashed the throne. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I do think. I guess my my critique at the end of this, I would have liked to have seen a more significant stare down between these two teams. Uh, I get what the Young Bucks were doing by mm -hmm. trying to be kind of uh, cheeky, but. I think a little bit more of a, a significant stare down would have made that matchup next time when they have it feel a little more significant than just a, Hey, we're here. Bye. It, I, no, no, I, I get it. Maybe it could have been just one and one because it almost feels like Nicholas and Matthew are, are playing good cop, bad cop. Have the oh. one be the cheeky guy and have the other one have the, the death stare. You know? Yeah. Um, but uh, we got a Darby Allen is hanging out with a guy that looks like Tony Hawk. And if you follow Tony Hawk on social media, you'll get that joke. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I don't know if you guys follow Tony Hawk, but he always is posting about how people say, Hey, you look like that guy, Tony Hawk. And he's like, Oh really? I get that all the time. And they're like, Oh yeah. I wonder what he's up to right now. <laughs> uh, it's, he's a funny follow. You should, uh, you should follow him if you don't, but um Doing some good stuff, setting up skate parks. That's pretty cool. But also we got a segment with Hook and Jericho. And Jericho's offering to help Hook. And Hook is like, look, I know who you are, but I also know who you are. Uh, Jimmy, I, I like this in the sense that Jericho for five years has been helping people and mm -hmm. kind of using them to help himself. And Hook is basically saying, like, I know who you are. And I know why you're helping me. It's because you're going to try to take advantage of me somehow. But maybe I can use you along the way. Uh, do you like this dynamic? I, I don't mind it. I like the tone that Chris Jericho used. I liked it was just calm, reserved. It felt like just a conversation as opposed to wrestling promo. Hey, you know mm -hmm. what? If you need some advice, you come talk to me. No, no, it felt like Chris Jericho was offering honest advice to him. And, and Hook, you know, Yes, he's he's connected with the audience, but I'd like to hear more from him. And I, I get where they were trying to go with this thing, with Hook saying, yes, I know who you are, but I know who you are. You mm -hmm. know, alluding to what you said, Jack. But just I just want to sit, hear a little bit more from him to sound like a little more conviction mm -hmm. in what he says, if that makes any kind of sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. George, what, what's your take on Jericho and Hook? Do you like the pairing? Uh, I know... Some people have strong opinions of Jericho, and and a lot of people love Hook. Do you like this pairing? Not really. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just I just think it was kind of a little bit forced. Uh, you kind of had like Jericho. I thought it was gonna be like a bigger announcement. I thought, you know, all it was is like, hey, call me if you need me. Like really, that's it. Like I don't know. Doesn't other people kind of have that relationship with Jericho? Is any kind of, you know, not just behind the scenes, not just you know. Uh, you know, kayfabe talk, but like, you know, I would like to think that he's a veteran and likes to offer his support to whoever asked for it. So I just thought it was a little weird. Like, like, why? I don't know. I, 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 I'm a little confused about what Jericho's trying to accomplish. I mean, he, one week he's Lionheart, another week he's have people singing out to Judas. I don't know. I mean, I'll see where it's going. I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. But from what I've seen so far, like, nothing's really caught my attention. Uh, I always, I think that it's, 
working with Jericho, like on, and I mean, you know, on screen, obviously, is a bit like a deal with the devil. Like you're gonna get a lot screen time, you're gonna get opportunities, but you know, at the end of the day, Jericho's always gonna Jericho, and Jericho's mm. always gonna try to put himself uh, in the forefront. Ever since that friendship ceremony, he's been a different Jericho. Right. But, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, so I think that that's kind of what the the deal is, and now it's a matter of. Uh, who's going to win the golden fiddle? That's a, a, a old song reference there, but uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, devil went we'll, down to Georgia. Devil went down mm -hmm. to Georgia. Will will Hook win? Come up, uh, come on top, or will Jericho? Uh, so I, at least that's where it feels like it's going. I I could be wrong. I did. Feel like, bit, what does? Yeah. I was going to say, what does Hook have to gain? Right, like he already beat Jericho. Like what is it? I mean, I don't know. I'd like to see a little bit of cockiness of like, what do I have to learn from the guy that I just beat? Just I know it yeah, sounds very nice. like, you know, cocky and whatnot, but there's also like, you know, because there's this mystery behind Hook of like, you know, we've seen him do some great things. So it's like, what convince me why I need you when I was the one that pinned your shoulder to the mat just one week ago. So I would have liked to maybe seen a little bit more like that. Um, maybe kind of humble Jericho a little bit. I know he's Jericho is a legend. He's obviously one of the greatest of all time, but just something to the extent of like, you know, not just hook saying, all right, but. Well, Jer well, George, let me ask you this. What do you do with Jericho uh, with, uh, with hook? Because the thing I think that really makes him fascinating. So many people is he is mysterious. He doesn't talk. You don't really get much from him, but from a story writing standpoint, that is a very tough nut to crack on what you do with him every week if you can't give us much. You know what I mean? Like, so what, like what, do you, see, what do you do with them? I'd like to kind of see him just kind of scout people for the sake of like beating people. Like him coming out and says like, oh, I can be that guy and watch me do it next week. Right. Like just something new because usually it's the other way around. Usually it's people going after. And I, I don't consider that championship a real championship. It's just there. It's, it's just a prop. I know for the sake it's of an it, outlaw all, championship. It's yeah. Like all, tit all titles are props and they are for to some extent. But I, for that one, it really is a prop like there's. There's no like, what are you the champion of, right? To some extent, you're the champion of the TV, you're international or the world, but how, what are you? What are you that champion of when you're the FTW champion, right? Of so, the FT. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. What does the F mean? <laughs> oh, never, uh, never, never mind. Um, but yeah, I just, I, rock, I, we can't get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> but I would just kind of like to have him come out and be like, you know what? Like, I, I, I want to see a wrestler just make a checklist, right? I know Cody made that checklist when he first got released of people he wanted to wrestle, but I want to see Hook make a checklist of like, listen, these are the guys that I want to beat. Just, mm -hmm. just start going down the card. I want to beat this person. I want to beat that person. This person's next. That person's next. Not like a Goldberg, but just more meticulous. Obviously, Hook is a lot more skilled to, uh, uh, you know, from what we've seen uh, when it came to that. So I don't know, just something new, something different. Like he beat Jericho. All right, let me let me see who else I'm going to scout. Not not so much have people come after me. But before you know it, I'm going to start looking at people who I can beat and how I can show that I belong, you know, and one of the top, as one of the top guys. You know, I could see them doing some something like that. I, I, I compare it to like what they did with The Undertaker for a while. I mean, and I mean it a little differently than with The Undertaker, but like you have someone who wins a few matches and they're doing whatever. And then every now and again, the lights go out and then you see the hook thing go up on the on the ceiling mm -hmm. and his music hit and he hits and he comes out. It's like, oh, that's the next person hooks challenging. Yeah. Hook, you have the match. Maybe hook wins. And then he's gone for a few weeks. And then the same thing happens. And you just never know who's yeah. going to be the next person hook is coming for. But yeah, then so he, instead he, of. Sorry, George. Go ahead. I was going to say, and like, you know, in Goldberg sense, we had a who's next. I want hook to come out and say, you know what? Your next. Your next. Nice. Yeah. That, that's what he has to do. He has to find a persona and he has to be able to verbalize it so that the fans, you know, cut a promo where say after coming out, like you said, put that hook sign up there. He comes out and beats somebody. And afterwards, you never know when I'm going to appear and who I'm coming after. And when mm -hmm. I do, watch your back. Bet. Something along those lines. Uh, uh, <laughs> bet. <laughs> bet. Uh, we got a four way for the number one contendership to the TBS title Willow, Anna J, Sky Blue, Chris Statlander with Mercedes on commentary. A slug fest with Willow Nightingale getting the dub post match. Julia Hart attacks Willow with the title, stares down Mercedes, and then gets chased off by Statlander. Jimmy Cordaris. Mm -hmm. 
Is the TBS title the top women's title in AEW right now, in your estimation? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> it, it, they're, they're muddying the waters with this, especially with which title. Like Mercedes Monet comes in, debuts, looks like a million bucks, looks like a huge superstar, and, and it feels like she's going after the number two title. That's how I feel. And this match, you know, all credit to the ladies. They worked their butts off. They they, they put on, they tried really hard, but it, it wasn't engaging because you almost, again, one of those situations, I hate to sound like a Mr. Predictable. I, you know, I knew I kind of had a feeling that Willow was going to win. I understand why, because it furthers the story that they're trying to tell. But at the same time, you know, you had Mercedes on commentary, which didn't really resonate. She mm -hmm. sounded, she I don't want to sound, say that she sounded disinterested, but I wanted to hear more pep from her, more yeah. aliveness, you know, and put the put the ladies over. Yeah. The, you know, any one of these women could go, you know, this roster is stacked. Put it over big time. And then the aftermath was what it was and her standing up and staring off just, again, under, underwhelming for me. It, it was interesting that uh, you didn't hear much from her on commentary. She's such a good speaker as well. I thought she was going to drop some some bars, as the kids say. Uh, but she did keep it pretty. It felt like she kind of got the point in that she doesn't like Willow, and which kind of let us know where things were going there. But well, actually, I, I should say that I didn't know because I didn't know if if, uh, if Mercedes was going to get involved and mess it up for Willow. But uh, but George, uh, Corey pride is, is in the, ch in the chat saying things, uh, earlier tonight said, uh, Mercedes should get Osprey and Okada's pushes. And, uh, who is Mercedes feuding with? I'm confused. Uh, first off, I, I think it's pretty clear. She's feuding with Willow. Uh, that's the person she's, she's targeting, which I think makes sense given their history. But George, do you think Mercedes should have come in and been putting on matches and winning matches or do you think it's better to hold off that first match for a bigger show like dynasty or whatever that that day will be it's definitely better to hold her off uh listen she's an attraction uh she's obviously not not at the rocks level but she's pretty mainstream as far as the star wars crowd you know she's going to the red carpet she's doing a lot of things that a lot of mainstream people do um and i'm, I'm not saying that's the only reason why um you know she should be rustling here and there uh i think the time's gonna come for that but listen like she, she she and we said it we talked about it like last week like one of these three is not like the other sasha banks is above by all means and star power above osprey and okada so she shouldn't be wrestling like osprey and okada because she's got she's a much bigger star than osprey and okada and her first match in AEW, especially with her not being there previously, like the other two wrestlers, her first match there should be a huge deal, not just a throwaway match that maybe people might forget. Uh, and you know, by all means, we'll see if people remember the Fletcher and an Osprey match, maybe, maybe in a year, maybe we will, maybe we won't. But I don't think you can take that chance with somebody like a Mercedes Monet. You got to have that big platform, uh, or maybe even hold her off for double or nothing. Who knows? Uh, especially with Dynasty kind of already having two big time matches there you kind of don't want mercedes to be lost in the shuffle right like does anybody even mm -hmm. remember uh soraya's first match i know it was against Britt baker but not not a lot of people will remember off the top of their head that it was at full gear um mm -hmm. so you kind of, i, I want to say you want to make it a much bigger deal you don't want it to get lost in the swerve osprey danielson joe shuffle of what we're seeing in dynasty yeah, make her a featured attraction. She mm -hmm. has to be the one that people want to pay to see. And again, I don't, I don't want to say be like the other guys, but take some mm -hmm. cues from them. Look at what they're mm -hmm. doing with with uh, real superstars who are not doing matches, they're not in matches right now. They're just whether it's promo work or not promo work. You know, like we talked about on Monday night. Just take little elements of it and make it your own. And that's what she needs to do. She has to find herself and find that voice. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you said, she is a good speaker. Let's hear it. I want to hear it. It it's um I know George or uh, Jimmy, I want to ask you this because we're also getting in the chat. Um why is Mercedes staring at Julia Hart then if she's feuding with Willow? And I think the answer is obviously Julia Hart has the title, which is why she's looking that way, but 
clearly this is not just a straightforward one-on-one -on -one situation. It is a very entangled web for the TBS mm -hmm. championship. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy, do you think that's the best way to approach this, having this kind of a tangled web with all these women involved with Mercedes? Or should they have gone to a more basic A, B equals C scenario, if that makes sense? No, sometimes the tangled web you weave works well because you're giving people uh, an option. And you're giving them scenarios where you don't know where it's going instead of being that predictable, okay, uh, wrestler A versus wrestler B. And this is mm -hmm. what it is, you know, give them some unpredictability. That's the beauty of this business when you can get people to think, oh, you know what? I'm not sure what's going to happen here. I'm going to tune in next week to find out. Mm -hmm. I like that approach. But at the same time, when you connect those dots, eventually they have to make sense as opposed yeah. to have, having people guessing why is this happening? Right. Let yeah. us know why it's happening. Eventually, you don't have to tell us right away, but eventually, but like I said, eventually you do have to tell us. Yeah, I do think, I think what they're doing is fine. I'm enjoying it. And for people who think I'm just being a, an apologizer, you can just, you can check out everything I said about the rock and what's going on in WWE when it mm -hmm. was very confusing for a little bit there. I said at the same time, look, man, this is going to work out just fine. Give them time. It'll, yeah. it'll be, it'll, they'll get there and we're going to love it. And we do. So that, that's that's the issue today. The, you know, people want the you know, car crash television. They want in, instant gratification it, to happen as opposed to sitting back and relaxing and listening to the story. You know, uh, I, I refer to stuff like movies when you talk about uh, today's world is fast and furious. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants the fast and furious and ridiculous cars jumping over buildings and stuff like that as opposed right. to. You know, movies that resonate intellectually. Like I take a guy like Robert De Niro. I'm a big Robert De Niro fan. In yeah. a movie like Raging Bull mm -hmm. or Cape Fear. Yeah. Or something like that. You, you know, those they play with your brain and there isn't a lot of action there. But when there is action, it means Ooh. something. Taxi I, I will, driver. I taxi, will tell you yeah. though, if taxi driver jumped that taxi over a building, you got my ticket. <laughs> 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 uh we got a couple of uh, we got a couple of backstage segments. I just kind of want to get through and get your guys' overall thoughts because uh, I don't know if they're really worth diving into too much at this point. But Dustin Rhodes uh, has a run in with the Butcher. They're going to have a match on Friday. Uh, ben Makowitz uh, speaks with Tony Storm and congrats her. And they have some good use of synergy with uh, Turner Classic Movies. And Kyle O'Reilly says that he's happy he got his win but he's glad he's sticking to staying alone and adam copeland says he's done with christian george a lot of stuff there uh, a lot of different segments any thoughts on kyle o'reilly tony storm adam copeland and or dustin rhodes and the butcher i think it's just a good, a good way to keep people in the loop obviously that ending of dynamite last week uh was so fire that we didn't want it to kind of just be like because that, that's kind of what uh my one of my biggest uh criticisms about AEW was in the past where you had something big happen and then there's no mention of it for like two three weeks so i kind of like that you know after that big uh you know angle that closed out last week's dynamites at least we saw adam copeland at least we saw kyle o'reilly you know after his first uh match in a long time you know have something to say uh tony stone kind of what i said earlier about osprey about being there uh, every single week tony stone's a star uh, mm -hmm. she should be there every single week i will pay her to hear her talk every single day like she's she's got everything that you can ask for in a pro wrestler whether it's in ring or behind the mic so, uh, so it's li these little things that i think go a long way in terms of making sure that people just don't feel forgotten yes mm -hmm. uh i yeah yeah jimmy my big takeaways uh from these the one i really liked is i love that adam copeland told us specifically i'm done with christian so we right. as viewers can kind of go okay there's not going to be a rematch this isn't something where how does christian get it back or whatever we can just kind of go oh that's done next chapter starts on saturday right uh i also loved as i said the synergy of turner classic movies uh I, working yeah. with tony storm i thought that was beautiful what were your thoughts no that was gold uh it, even in black and white it was gold and it you know meshing the brands is of course what what you want to do but at the same time it just came off so well tony storm you're right she is a star she mm -hmm. is knocking it out of the park it doesn't matter in the ring out of the ring whatever she does she is much watched television right mm -hmm. now and uh, kyle o'reilly I, I i get the laid backness of him but at the same time i want to, not everybody could be all fire and 
we need to have some calmness and I don't mind the calmness, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's just this look about him in that white t-shirt that looks like it hasn't mm-hmm. been ironed, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a visual guy as well uh, mm-hmm. as uh, trying to read into things with my mind, but that tells me you haven't slept. Uh, you're sleeping on your sister's couch or something. I don't know. <laughs> it just, it doesn't, it doesn't fit. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I, it's always tough for me to talk about Kyle O'Reilly because he's got a very strong fan base, and so people love what he does. Uh, but I'm kind of with you in that I didn't really feel sold on watching him. He didn't really – I always talk about how I think the best people at selling me a ticket have been uh, – Paul Heyman is the best, I think, oh. ever at it personally. But, like, the – yeah, you know, I'm just I, – I'm hoping I keep winning. That'd be great, you know? I really hope – like, it's like – well, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to tune into a guy who's just kind of like, all right, let's let's see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, Paul Heyman. I, I'm a Paul uh, Heyman guy, 100 uh, percent through and through from when he was, you know, basically on SmackDown. Hey, remind me after we're done this review. I got a Paul Heyman story real quick for you. So, do you want to dive into it real quick? Is it is it a well, quick one or is it, is it or is it an off air story? No, it's a, no, no, it's not an off air story. It's it's very simple. It's just about how approachable he is, and 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 he takes ideas from everybody. Even the simplest little things, like for example, uh, do you remember the supermarket brawl? Yes, between Booker, with Booker T and, and Steve Austin. Steve Austin, yeah, yeah, I was standing right beside Paul watching it on the monitor because they they had shot it earlier that day. I, I want to say it was in California somewhere, but I, you know, I don't know. But they did the thing, and they're having the ma- they're and we're laughing our butts off, going, "This is great stuff. This is awesome." You know, mm-hmm. Booker's covered in all this stuff, and he's covered with flour, and he can- brings him to the conveyor belt at, uh, at checkout leaves them there and starts walking out and i'm just standing there and i just went price check on a jackass <laughs> and paul said looked at me goes what'd you say and i thought he was hot i said yeah price check on a jackass he says where were you when we had the meeting and I said, <laughs> next thing you know because smackdown was taped that uh, in those days when i watched it back on the friday or the thursday that in those days they vo'd it in with Austin's awesome. voice going price check on a jackass. And then the next oh, wow. TV, I see Paul. I said, uh, I see you viewed it in. He said, yeah, thanks for that. That worked. And I'm like, <laughs> I hope you yeah. got a producer credit. No, but I don't mind. It's just, <laughs> it was just cool for me to say, hey, man, they use my idea. Yeah. And it happens every once in a while where you just say something off the cuff and they go, hey, let's use that. Like, uh, again, doing the uh, instant replay. I'm the only referee, I believe, that ever used in- utilized instant replay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they uh, yeah if they if well if they took that idea forever they'd have ruined wrestling, Jimmy. It's a, it, I know it makes I too know. much sense to do to use that. It, it can works I, in the right circumstance. Can I add something about Can I add something about Tony Storm though? Yeah. Sure. One of the things that I it makes her character so so successful is that she's like literally fully committed to the role. Like yes. there's no like breaking her and and you know little criti- criticism coming up. Sky blue. Like I, there's, there's no criticism when it comes to her entering abilities. So nothing like that, but like, what is her character? Like she, she turned heel, I guess you can say, but she's still kind of coming out there, like kind of doing a little smirk and she like winks to the camera a couple of times. Like she's still trying to do a lot of those cute little things. Right. And it's like, what are you doing? Like, I thought you turned, that's why I think somebody like Julia Hart works because she fully stepped away from that cheerleading character that she was doing. And I think sky blue is like, I don't know if it, it feels like as if like she's too busy trying to like wink at somebody or wh- whatever it is. I don't know who knows. Maybe it's part of her character. Please somebody educate me. But I just feel like it's not for me. It's not really working with her because she's not fully committed to this transformation that she's done since turning heel. And again, you look at Tony storm night and day, Tony storm, like, she's all in like, there's no, when she's on, when she's doing interviews, when she's doing, uh, whether it's interviews, uh, you know, for like a podcast or for AEW, it's literally this role. It kind of reminds me of the broken Hardy, the broken Matt Hardy thing. One of the things I didn't get it at first, but when he was on like G- uh, Jim Ross's podcast and he was fully in the character, I was like, I'm all in. I am yeah. like, I am sold on it. And so it just kind of shows me like Tony Storm, like by all means, like take my money because you are doing everything right. Mm-hmm. It's and it's more than just like being in the character and embodying it, but she's got to be doing research because she uses phrases and acts certain. What did ways. she say? Raise so, your testicles? Is that what she said? 
Because I know she does a chin up, chin up, tits out, and then watch out for the shoe. But she mm-hmm. was he was saying it to the guy, and he was like, "No, oh, something, something." I think she said she said like raise your testicles, and then watch wow. out for the some 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 kind of shoe thing. And I was like, whatever. But if anybody out there is like yeah. listening, I love to know what it, she said word for word. But it was great. But yeah, like all of her like phrases and the the way she walks and talks and carries herself isn't just like. I'm trying to be this character. She's clearly researched this. She's clearly yeah. looked at old Hollywood and really like she's gotten, she looked up words that were probably popular back then. She's <laughs> just figured like, it's not just playing the character. She's doing research. On yeah. This. She's, she's probably got Turner classic movies on 24 seven. Yeah. yeah. She's, yeah. she's doing the work. So that's very cool to see too. That's why it's been so successful. But uh, speaking of success, we get to the end of the show, the main event, uh, Swerve versus Takeshita, where we get video packages throughout the show from both guys. Uh, Don Callis, one of my favorite lines, Swerve's house is in the Callis neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> Swerve says he's trying to win for something bigger than himself. Match is hard hitting, uh, big moves, not as fast paced as I think a lot of people would have thought this one was going to be more of a, a heavy handed matchup. It goes overtime. Swerve gets the win and is the number one contender. Uh, Jimmy, this is one where I feel like we we kind of this is another one we figured Swerve was winning this one, but uh, I, I thought they did a great job of making this one interesting. They did, and the analogy I'm going to use is, and I've used this before, where it, this was like um, like you said, uh, we figured that Swerve was going to be the guy who comes out on top on this in this one, but it's like a movie that, or a book that's based on a true story. We know mm-hmm. what the outcome at the end is going to be. It's how you tell that story getting to that outcome. And mm-hmm. I think they told it really well. Swerve selling as a baby face was awesome tonight. That was off mm-hmm. the charts. I, I loved it. it because, you know, one of my critiques in the past has been not enough selling of big moves. Everybody, get, you know, gets up from a Canadian destroyer and stuff like that. Everybody's taking DDTs and now they're back, they're dueling DDTs and stuff like that. Right. But, this match was hard hitting. Both guys sold at the right times. You know, mm-hmm. Takesha didn't lose any steam in losing this match. So it worked for everybody. And they got that promo at the end by Samoa Joe. I'm a big Joe guy, man. And that promo was fire for many reasons. But the big thing is when Joe speaks, you believe every word he says. Mm. He's got mm-hmm. that tone where he starts off slow. And it's like, you, oh, my goodness, this guy's. And then he raises that level. And he, he almost feels like he wants to show up, but then he brings it back down to that menacing kind of tone. And I love that in Joe and, and looking forward to him and Swerve at the pay-per-view. So that's going to be awesome. Uh, yeah, I always say Joe could read the numbers in Pi, and it would be intimidating the way he <laughs> re- the way he says it. You know, he, could read a, he could read a grocery list and have you scared of him at the way he reads it. Uh, but George, I said this on Twitter. I want to repeat it now. I feel like Swerve lately has been doing a anything you can do, I can do better run where it's like, oh, you do death matches. I can do it better. Oh, you do high flying. I can do it better. Oh, you like to do hard hitting. I can do it better. You're a you're a good guy. I can do it. I feel like he's just over the past year or so. He has really shown he can do anything. I think that I think the word is a uh, is it multiversatile? Mm hmm. Sure. Just being able to apply himself to pretty much any situation, whether it's being a, a full-fledged heel, which we saw some pretty dastardly things just about, was it, like three, four months ago? Um, and to the point where he's he, he plays that babyface role really, really well. I mean, I, um, you know, obviously we all know he came from the Seattle area. He did a lot of things with Defy. So I was Coma. really a fan of him uh, mm-hmm. back when he was doing that, with doing things in PCW, and he was just being able to show uh, everything that he can do. And... That now he's just showing it on, on a bigger platform, and and kudos to him because he is another guy that's knocking at, knocking at a park every single time. He's one of those guys where I know it goes without saying, but like one of those people that literally capitalizes on every single second that he's on TV. Like there's no wasted minute whenever he's on TV. Mm-hmm. Jimmy, what I love about Swerve too, I'm I'm a huge Swerve fan. Uh, I think he's po- probably one of my personal favorites right now is that he made this switch from being a bad guy to being a good guy, but he didn't change who he was. He wasn't one of those people that, you know, sometimes you see someone and they're horrible and then they, they turn into a good guy and they're suddenly like, I've always loved you here in the state of Virginia, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And you're like, this isn't how you talk. Like, why are you, or, or vice versa. Suddenly they're like, you people, he's the same guy. He's, he didn't really change who he is but he's somehow a good guy now. 
No, and it works for everybody that is like that, that gets over with the audience because the audience is invested in. Look at the one of the biggest stars of all time, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Didn't matter whether he was a baby face or a heel. Did he ever change anything he did or said in the ring? He no, was what? the same guy. As a baby what? face, you, well, well, as a baby <laughs> face, he would go in there and throw fists. Yeah. As a heel, he would go in there and throw fists. That, that's that was Stone Cold Steve Austin and Swerve is trying to prove right now and they think he's doing a good job of it like you said George he's showing that he is versatile you know mm -hmm. anything you can do I can do better yes and that should be the mantra for him anything you can do I can do better and you know tell Joe that you think you're the toughest guy in in the this this industry wait till we meet at the pay-per-view something along those lines anyway, yeah you know. it's this matchup at Dynasty is definitely building up to be one of those. Um, I'm not saying it's the same level, so everyone pump pump the brakes, but yeah. it has that like un, uh, uh, immovable object, unstoppable force kind of thing where both guys won't be deterred. You know, uh, again, I'm not saying it's Hogan versus Andre. Calm down. I'm just saying it's right. that like. Swerve's not backing down and Joe ain't backing down, but only one of them is going to come out with the championship at, Di at Dynasty. And Joe, uh, George, that is literally the kind of mindset and vibe you want going into a big show, is it not? That, like, I, I don't know. Neither of these guys are going to give up, but only one of them can win. Especially kind of going back last year where there were a lot of uh, title defenses that were done by MJF that I knew that he wasn't going to lose. Like I'd, I mm -hmm. had no doubt that he was going to, he was going to, I had no doubt that he was going to win that four pillars match. I just didn't see any other, any of the other guys uh, become world champion just yet. Uh, but this is the complete opposite. I mean, literally Swerve on, is on such a hot streak and such a role that it's kind of, it, it's his time now. But even mm -hmm. if you were to lose, like Samoa Joe is doing just the best work of his career where you don't want that to lose out too. I think this is one of the, one of those instances of it's a win-win situation. No matter who comes out on top, no matter who leaves champion, uh, who leaves Dynasty as champion, it's going to be a win for, for either side. Yeah, very, very fun stuff that's happening over in AEW. Uh, let us know uh, as we wrap up here in the chat your final thoughts on this week's AEW Dynamite. And if you're watching later, of course, in the comment section, just let us know what you thought of the show and maybe favorite thoughts or maybe mm -hmm. things you disagreed with that we said on here or that you did agree with. Uh, Jimmy, final thoughts on the show and where can the world find you online? Well, for the most part, I, it was enjoyable. There was uh, some stuff, obviously, I could nitpick about. And uh, I hate to say it with uh, with all due respect to the ones wearing the striped shirt. Uh, they need to work on that big mm -hmm. time, in my opinion, because they're an integral part of telling a story in a, in a match and how you utilize your referees and that sort of thing. So that's been an issue I've had with, with uh, their company for a long time. And I don't, again, I don't want to harp on it too much because it is a tough tough you know, place to be in you know what i mean because you're caught between a rock and a hard place if you don't do it right if you do it right do does anybody have any direction to them that sort of thing but you know that's a, yeah that's a, that's a rant for another day and speaking of rants you can catch my ref and rants so from monday to fridays on all my social media platforms again not to critique to tear down but just to tighten little screws and help elevate whatever i may be talking about you can catch me here on mondays and wednesday nights usually talking after Raw and after Dynamite. And, uh, of course, the Reffing It Up podcast with my good brother in stripes, uh, Brian Hebner and RJ, who holds the glue together. This week, we have a power couple. It's a, it's a two-for-one this week where we have Angelina Love and Ooh. her husband, Roddy, Rod, Rod Psycho, uh, Psycho, oh, oh, my goodness, Psycho oh, Boy my. Potter. I, I'm yeah. getting confused with the words. I'm getting all... It, it was a good one. We had a we yeah. had a fun time chatting with those, and of course, Angelina Love from the Toronto area. So, you know, it's fun seeing good Canadian folk getting into it. If you know what I mean. Yes, mm. <laughs> I love the glass. You got to wear those uh, from now on, Jimmy. Uh, well, but well, maybe maybe I'll wear them to Money in the Bank, and then it comes here in Toronto. You should you should help ref that. You got to lay the you know be the the order there. I got a question for you, Jimmy. Do they have? Is there an actual official rule book in WWE? Oh, the... I wish I wish I had it handy. Yes. Do they really? Is it uh, mm. is it something? Do they they don't publish that though. They keep it no, under lock and key, or no, can you go buy it? There there was a book that they published not long ago. Uh, well, actually, it was a while ago. That you know, 
which yeah. listed the rules in it and that sort of things. But of course they change over the years. They get altered yeah. a little bit here and there, but for the most part they haven't changed or shouldn't be changed over the years. But yeah, you know, that'd be, that'd be kind of fascinating to have. I might have to look that up. Um, <laughs> Uh, but Man Cave Sessions, by the way, says, ready for Philly, baby. I will be in Philly, Man Cave Sessions. Maybe I'll see you there. Uh, mm -hmm. Should be fun. I'm going to try to get into to Ring of Honor while I'm over there, too. Uh, I have got a, I've got a show I'm doing commentary for that doesn't quite conflict. So I should be able to hop from one to the other. Cool. Um, but uh, I am very excited for Philly. That's going to be a fun trip. George, uh, as I said, this, this week in the past few weeks feels like AEW has really taken – uh, the things that they've needed to work on and have just started working on them and you're seeing big differences. What were your overall thoughts this week and what were uh, where can we we'll find you online and uh, all the stuff you do, uh, all the interviews you have and things like that? I think uh, for the most part, it was another good show. Uh, if I, I'm not a big comparer, but if I were to compare, it wasn't as good as last week, but that doesn't mean it was a bad show. It was mm -hmm. still, it, it flowed still really well. A lot of things, uh, the, a lot of segments were not just wasted and not just having two guys out there for the sake of wrestling. Even though I know that's what a lot of people like, they just want to see wrestling matches and nothing more again, which is fine. I'm not knocking what people like or dislike, but for me, uh, it, it's, it was easier to follow because it was like the transitions between the segments were just, uh, they just flowed a lot better in terms of like, again, going back to what I said last week, oh. having me look forward to something at the end of the show or by the end of the show, or even to the next segment. And also having me look forward to something that's going to happen next week, having me remember, Oh yeah, that's what happened last week too, with the edge and, and, or Copeland and cage. Uh, so kind of good reminder of that again, going back to what I said, make people regret last week or not watching last week. And I know a lot of people probably who didn't watch last week, be like, man, I wish I would have seen that, that Copeland cage match. And that, you know, again, going back to, so I think in that terms, uh, I thought it flowed really well. A uh, great show of dynamite. Uh, again, we're not, we're not seeing bad, uh, bad programming in, in these weeks, whether it's AEW, WWE, or even NXT. I know WWE is usually on pretty much, all all the cards are in so close to WrestleMania, but you know, again, that has nothing to do with AEW and AEW just keeps continuing their nice little momentum. And uh yeah, I'm all for it. I'm all for yeah. seeing that. Sorry to cut you off, George, because so you can get mm -hmm. your pro, uh, social media stuff out there and everything. But the one thing I'd l like to see them change, just uh, again, from a production standpoint, get rid of that darn picture in picture and kind of figure yes. out when to go to break where they don't have a lot of action going on in that little square in the corner, because that's what they tend to do. They tend to have a lot of action going on. And when you have that going on, you need the commentary team to help tell that story for the crowd at home, instead of being focused on some uh, eatery or something like that, that's being shown on three quarters of the screen. So I wish they would yeah. figure out a better timing on when to put those commercials in. You put know, them in between matches. If you have to go to break during the match, uh, this used to drive me nuts about WWE all the time because every yeah. time they'd go to break, there would be a spot outside the ring. Okay, what will happen when we come back? You know, and it was like for every match that went to break. But now I understand why they do it. It's because you don't want to go to break in the middle of action. Mm -hmm. You want them, to, you know? Uh, I, I yeah. Guess. No, I uh, look. I know it's about making money, uh, and mm -hmm. they probably get more money for picture in picture, but. I would rather they bump the price of the pay-per-views up like five bucks a piece than and just get rid of picture in picture mm -hmm. forever. I hate I hate it. I hate it on all companies. I just mm -hmm. I would rather just go to a commercial break. I, it's it, it nothing takes me out of the show more than picture in picture. It absolutely kills me. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know and why. I just ah, it, go to it, commercial it, then let the referees buzz them. We're going to commercial break. Grab a hold. Yeah. It's uh so uh, I'm with you there. Uh George for the people on our audio only though, what's your social media? Uh you can follow me at George Herm or G Hermosa G H E R M O Z A on Twitter, Instagram. Uh you can follow my YouTube channel, uh the Wrestling Chatter YouTube channel, uh on social media it's TW Chatter. And the past week I'm trying to incorporate a lot more short clips, so I opened the TikTok page, I uploaded some stuff on the on the Facebook reels and the YouTube shorts and the Instagram uh, stuff and whatever and all the jazz. Uh but I, I did interview uh somebody today which I'm going to reveal right now, but I did interview somebody earlier today, a uh, former WCW tag team champion. Uh, if you guys want to guess really quick, but uh, it went well. I'm in the process of editing together. Uh, obviously there was some technical snafus that I got to get rid of. Cause I can't just air it like that. And I should be posted in the next few days. Any, uh, any guesses? 
Well, temp, a, a former tag team champ is a pretty broad. Yeah, well, I mean, broad but 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 that's but that's also all he won in the in, in WCW. Uh, oh. oh, did it have to do anything with spikes on the shoulder pads or anything? No, no, no darn. Stevie Ray. No, but that's a good guess. Oh. Although he was a, uh, I guess, uh, asterisk television champion when he took over Booker T. But that's a good guess. Oh, you're right. He was. Oh. Uh, he was the uh, the television champion. Mm. Who was it? Uh, he was the American male himself, Scotty Riggs. Oh, oh Scotty okay. Riggs. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I, uh, good, good conversation there. Mm -hmm. uh, I know he's been in the news recently. Uh, he kind of had a transformation himself, uh, did the DDP yoga and pretty much looks like a whole new man. Uh, we talked about all those things. We talked about his uh, early days in, uh, you know, pre WCW. We talked about him teaming in with Buff Bagwell. Uh, we talked about the creation of the uh, classic American males theme song, which I know is Jack's favorite. Um, yeah. But a, a lot of good things. I know a lot of things. Uh, I always thought the eye patch was a work or not a work. We answered that question on the interview. Uh, but yeah, a lot of, I can't wait nice. to share with with everybody here. So uh, Scotty Riggs, the next guest coming up on the rest of Cheddar. Hopefully, hopefully the eye patch wasn't because of Haku. That's a story for another day. <laughs> I know, I, have you heard about that story? Yeah. Oh with, yeah. With him and Jimmy Jack Funk. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. Good Lord. Anyways. The, the uh, Riggs was one of my favorite flock members. I always thought he was cool because of the eye patch, but I yeah. uh, absolutely have to check that out. Well, you can find me at Real Jack Farmer across all social media. Uh, of course, you can check me out here on Wrestling Inc. But next week, well, I'll be here Monday, but uh, after that, I'm going to Philly and I'm going to be doing commentary for a couple of shows on GCW's The Collective, starting with Defy Wrestling. They're going to have a banger of a show so you got to check that out if you can't be there live if you are there live come say hello why don't you if you're not there live get the show i believe it's on fight tv you can watch it there i think you can watch the whole slate of gcw shows which is really cool stuff there uh but otherwise follow at wrestling inc to stay on top of all the wrestling news and make sure to tune in on friday when we cover the after smackdown show that does it for us and i am now hitting the end stream button